This is Wax. Well, holla, you surfers, you goddamn nerds. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're all part of the tribe. How are the brakes looking? Got some lefts, some rights, some green rooms, a frames. A weekly surf talk radio show. Hopefully when you go out there, you'll find your green card and surf on the f***ing home. Poser. With your hosts, Cyrus Satsas. <laughs> All I need are some tasty waves, cool buzz, and I'm fine. Omar Echeverry. Vocals only, you f***ing grommet. Stay off my feet! And Natalie Rose with the news and weekend surf report. Surfing is out of this world. You just can't imagine the thrill of shooting the curl. Well, it positively surpasses every living emotion I've ever had. On ESPN 1700. <laughs> Good morning, San Diego and Orange County and coastal Los Angeles. This is Waxed Surf Talk Radio. I'm one of your hosts, Cyrus Sotsas. Natalie Rose will join us in just moments with a surf report and the news. Omar Echeverry, my partner in crimes in Santa Cruz. He's going to call in in a little bit. We're trying to get a hold of him right now. He's probably sleeping in. The dude's got a kid that's not even two years old. So uh, there are nights where I'm sure he's up on the reg. We have one of, one of in my opinion, is going to be one of my all-time favorite guests, the Endless Summer 2, in my humble opinion, is a reason why probably half of the people in this world who surf do it. I mean, it's I don't know how many people, especially family members and friends, who look at me in my maniacal surf lifestyle and they go, they just don't get it. They go, why are you so obsessed with this sport? Why do you care so much? Why do you put it above a lot of other priorities in life that it really shouldn't trump? And then they watch The Endless Summer and The Endless Summer 2 and they go, oh, that's why. And our guest today is one of the stars of that film. You can crank the music bit up a little bit. It's all right. I'll let people hear it. There you go. Uh, Pat O'Connell. He was the star of The Endless Summer 2. Wingnut was with him as well, but Wingnut was longboarding, so he's the, he's the supporting actor in the film. Pat O'Connell was a star. I jest, but it's kind of the truth. So yeah, Pat O'Connell's going to be on the program in just moments. Dude's a San Clemente native he owns salt creek that is literally his break when he's out there everyone else is going oh man now he's got to get the waves that pat doesn't want so he's going to join the program in about 10 minutes maybe even a little less than that we're gonna have a weekend surf report for you natalie rose will have that natalie good morning even on just like three hours of sleep you're looking on fuego girl good morning yeah i'm like i'm ready to go people should yeah hot and ready you, you are and people out there in their cars listening or later on listening on the on the internet on a podcast whatever you should know Natalie does not have a face for radio she's gonna she's gonna grow out of this position at some point and move on to much bigger and better things but while we have her we're blessed we're privileged we're not taking her for granted do I owe you money or something no you Look don't at all these compliments coming nah, in just appreciative but uh I, w- I want to real quick mention as well our website waxedradio.com is finally up and running Omar's brother is like our IT guy our web developer, and he finally got the site going. It's still got a lot of kinks, but it's up. All our shows are on there. The website's waxedradio.com, W-A-X-E-D radio.com. And that's also the handle for our Twitter account, Waxed Radio. Follow us on there. You're going to want to start doing that because in the near future, we're going to be doing contests, and it's all going to be through Twitter. And if you ever want to know who our guests are going to be, all through Twitter. So follow us there at Waxed Radio, our website, waxedradio.com. Let's take a really quick break, and then we'll have your weekend surf report. This is Wax on ESPN 1700. Visit our website, waxedradio.com, to get complete show podcasts. And follow us on all social media at Waxed Radio. Now, here's your weekend surf report. See, this is a weekend. Welcome back to Waxed. Visit our website, waxedradio.com. Follow us on Twitter, at Waxed Radio. This is a weekend where surf port is vital. Conditions are interesting out there at best. I've been surfing like a madman this week. Every day it's been different. One day the swell's coming from the northwest, one day from the west, one day from the south. One day the water feels great, the next day the water feels freezing. This is where Natalie Rose is going to earn her money. Omar Chiveri, by the way, we finally have on the phone. Good morning, O-Dog. Thanks for sleeping in. Oh, man, it's early. <laughs> I know. See, this is like the first show where I've actually gotten a decent amount of sleep. Oh, that's good. So I'm, I'm one for one today. I know you and Natalie look like you're exhausted, or at least, you know, I'm hearing. 
<laughs> I'm alive. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, Natalie, what's going on with the weekend surf report? Well, we do have some waves this weekend. A southwest groundswell that rolled in yesterday will be stable throughout the day and possibly remain until Sunday. Also on the rise is a west-northwest groundswell. The combination of both are leaving waves anywhere from 2 to 4 feet. Some south-facing beaches are reaching head-high to overhead. As for the winds, there is a light southeast wind blowing in early in the morning, but it won't compare to the winds blowing in from the west later in the evening. As for tides, they are drastic this weekend. Tides all weekend will be high in the morning and drop off in the afternoons, almost down to negatives. As you can tell, the surf is up this weekend, so go catch some waves. If you don't know, now you know. There's your surf report. I'm Natalie Rose. Hope to see you in the lineup. Thank you very much. So uh, ideally, what are the good spots, at least here in Southern California, uh, for people to go to? What will be the best spots? Um, well, I was up in like Newport yesterday, Orange County. So it was pretty like, it was like pumping up there and like trestles was going off for sure. Cause like that South swell is in. Yeah. So it's really filling in. I would go there. I mean, blacks would catch it as well. So yeah. Blacks but, catches anything pretty much. Doesn't it? Yeah. I don't really know. Like I didn't see any like Northwest facing beaches yesterday. So I don't know how that swell really is coming through, but the South swell is definitely hitting right now. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Oh dog. How's the swell up in Santa Cruz? South swells are a gem for all the places you're surfing at. How's it going there? Oh my gosh, waves are really, really good up here in Santa Cruz uh, all weekend. So uh, we had same combo swell came in uh, more south yesterday. Um, now I believe today is more of a northwest and building south and tomorrow. So waves are about, I'd say, three to five foot um, up here and going off. Fantastic. So if the weather outside of what's coming in the water, you know, abides, should be a great weekend of surfing. The only problem is the water is freezing. I know. Why is that? I don't know. It's freezing. Dude, it dropped like five degrees just overnight. The Northwest rolled in and brought some cold water. Man, oh dog, you and your Northwest. Go away. <laughs> no, it's cold. You, you know what they say is uh, it, it could be a little bit of the spring upwelling, too. Yeah. So, you know, all those uh, deep canyons, they get stirred up in spring with the south swells and the combo swells, and boy, it gets cold. Dude, seriously, dude. It was like literally one day I was like almost thinking, ditch the wetsuit. Next day, I want booties and gloves. Like, it was insane. Just a crazy, drastic uh, change in temperature. Anyways, uh, let's get to it, dude. Pat O'Connell, he started an Endless Summer 2. He's literally the reason why many of you out there are surfing today. He's next here on Wax on ESPN 1700. Visit our website, waxradio.com, to get complete show podcasts. And follow us on all social media at Waxed Radio. Now, more Wax. Welcome back to Waxed. Surf Talk Radio here on ESPN 1700. Reaching San Diego. Orange County, coastal Los Angeles. A beautiful morning. There is surf. And hopefully you're listening to this as you're getting out there, especially because of our next guest. Now, personally speaking, I think the year was 1993, 94. I, I don't know the exact age, but I was like 15, 16 years old. I'm visiting my cousin here in San Diego. I'm from Northern California uh, in the Bay Area. And he's got this movie on his TV. And I got introduced to a lot of very bad things at, at that age fun things and doing bad things is fun but anyway so i see this movie and the very next day i'm like i want to surf and i get the feeling a lot of people are in the same boat as me i mean it was one of the most influential movies ever especially when it comes to surfing then he went on to have a fantastic competitive career starred in not just one of my favorite movies but one of my favorite tv shows of all time drive through and it's a pleasure to finally have him on this program. He's, you know, one of my all-time favorite surfers and probably one of yours as well, Pat O'Connell. Pat, welcome to the program. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. That was a nice uh, introduction. Thanks, hey, man. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Where are you at this morning? I'm actually at home in Dana Point. I'm just uh, looking around, seeing uh, where to go surf. It looks like the, the buoys are out pretty substantially, so uh, that's a good thing. And probably put my board on the and uh, grab my bike and go ride down the trestles. Excellent. Well, nor and normally, you know, I've I've heard that Salt Creek is your is your main break, and that when you're there, you know, you're the king of that domain. Is that true? Is that where you normally at, or do you go on to? <laughs> you know what? In days past, I would have said more so, but uh, it's been uh, it's been a while, a few uh, few months at work, and 
I've been uh, pretty much buckling down there. I've been getting out, you know, on the weekends and uh, if possible in the early mornings. But, I, you know, it, it, <laughs> it hasn't been super great early in the morning. I found other things to do. So um, I'm sure some little Grom's probably out there saying that he's the king of the creek. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. And then you just go out there and remind him who's boss, slap him around like you should. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Omar Archiveri is on the phone as well. O-Dog, uh, say hello, good morning, and uh, shoot away if you have any questions. Yeah, Pat, how are you doing, man? Omar, how are you, buddy? Good, good. Life's great, man. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I just jump into questions. I'm so curious. What, what is an everyday uh, for Pat O'Connell these days? Yeah, um, it sort of changes. You know, right now, um, John John Florence is actually staying uh, with us, and um, so trying to help him uh, on his road to recovery. Um, he's been really, really great. He's uh, got a team of people that he kind of sees every day. Um, and it's been interesting to watch his sort of dedication to, uh, you know, getting back into it. And um, so, you know, it's been kind of working with him a little bit and make sure that's on track. And then, I mean, really my, my day-to-day is just to kind of oversee and make sure that we're kind of on point with uh, – you know, our early marketing program, uh, specifically athletes. And, and um, you know, so it's there's a lot of stuff going on. We have 10 uh, men on the world tour. We have two on the uh, women's side. Um, wow. Yeah, so we have, and you know, we've got regional people that are helping, and, you know, a kid named Brandon Gilmet, who lives here in Huntington Beach, um, he's kind of handling day-to-day with all of those guys, and he does, like, <laughs> an unbelievable job of making those guys feel super special. And then, you know, obviously Nat Young, Young making the final up there at uh, Bells. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. You know, just making sure everybody's on point and um, make sure they have a smile on their face. <laughs> and, and just to remind people, and we're joined by Pat O'Connell uh, here on Waxed, uh, you're the head of marketing for Hurley, which is, is arguably like the number one surf brand right now. And so, and then um, among many heavy hitters that you have in your lineup is John John Florence, who's, not just the future, but the present is surfing. So he's staying with you right now while he's rehabbing and also training. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's been fun. You know, it's 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 definitely uh, you know, I pull a lot on past experiences, but uh, I am really learning a lot because uh, what these guys are going through are um, in some ways are similar, but it, it is different. You know, there's more. I mean, look, there's a lot more money in the sport. There's a lot more attention uh, than there's ever been. And um, the guys are they're, they're truly athletes. And I think the transition from decades, you know, the 80s, guys kind of went at it one way. We took it, our, our generation, obviously with Kelly still doing it, but um, <laughs> took it a little bit more professionally. And then these guys have really, um, I mean, it's, if they eat, sleep, and drink. Um, oh my gosh. And and how, is, uh, how is John John's uh, ankle coming? Yeah, it's good. It's super good. Like, uh, you know, I think there's a question whether he'll be able to compete in Brazil. Um, but I think he's probably not too far off of actually surfing. Um, you know, I'd say probably three weeks. I don't know. Hard to say. I, I, the last, you know, I, I hear all the positive reports from the doctors and tell me how, how fast he's progressing. But um, That's good. You know, That's good. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, you know, who better than Pat O'Connell to uh, <laughs> help out all these guys on tour? That must be so good for these guys. Um, I think that's absolutely awesome. I, I was also wondering too are are you uh, are you heading up the tour notes, all the videos? Is, is that a little bit of your doing? Yeah. So so basically, obviously, with um, all these guys, we decided that we had to, you know, find a way. Every <clears throat> and so Peter King actually does that. Um, okay. For us, and, and it's it's been exactly the look. We have all these guys on tour. How do you bring some attention to these great stories and and. The whole, the whole hope was kind of getting a little bit of the stuff behind the scenes because obviously you watch a webcast or, you know, when they produce a television show, you see the same dude, you see the guy, he can surf well. Mm-hmm. But like, how did he get there? What did he do? What was his day to day? And I think right. those are the stories we're trying to focus in on. That's beautiful. And we have Pat O'Connell uh, joining us here on Wax. That he's currently the head of marketing for Hurley, but... Early in your career, and you were talking about the 80s, that's when you kind of got your, you know, you're getting your name out there, you started competing. But then, like your your huge breakthrough, without question, is a role that sh- that even to this day is is mm-hmm. still talked about. It's and the movie is a timeless classic. We're talking about the Endless Summer too, and you're the star of this film. I mean, this was a, a sequel to a cult classic. A, 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 I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe like the original, and if not both, the movies are in the Smith- Smithsonian. 
uh, just for being part of the American Film Institute. How did you how did you get this role? Like, I mean, explain the whole story that led to you becoming the star of The Endless Summer too. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks. It was um, it was pretty random, actually. Um, just as you would, if you can imagine, back in that day, Bruce had gone with his group and said, you know, they wanted to make this movie, and they had gone in the magazines and basically got a hit list. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found the top sort of ten names and started kind of going through them. Um, and I was on those lists, and then they had at the same time uh, a real good friend of mine uh, who surfs out at Salt Creek, a guy named Gary DePella, um, was great friends with Bruce and also one of the attorneys working on putting together documents to make the movie. Well, you know, as time would have it, like I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't. There was no cell phones back then, right. anyways. I didn't have an answer machine. <laughs> um, getting a hold of me was close to impossible. And you know, as uh, friends would do, they'd call and leave you. You know, tell say that they were somewhere that they weren't. And so when Bruce <laughs> actually finally did get a hold of me, I hung up on him. And I told him there's no way. Like I thought he was like, I was like, I thought it was a friend taking, you know, taking a piss out of me. So. Right. Um, after repeated attempts, I finally, you know, believed it was him, and I drove up and met with him uh, at Hollister Ranch, and um, it just went from there. It went really quick, and we were going to Costa Rica, and um, I don't think it ever really sunk in, and so I literally was at Costa Rica with the film crew and realized, like, holy cow, this is like a serious operation there. And, and so, and real quick, so the mo- so the how, in your opinion, like, going, going back real quick, you said they, they compiled a list of 10 surfers, that they wanted to narrow down. Like, what what do you think put you on that list? Like, what was their criteria? Do you think? Well, I was yo- I was young, and I was okay. like, you know, I think they wanted, uh, uh, you know, they wanted someone that could be on camera, but they also wanted someone who was at that time, you know, it was like the young up and coming surfer. Right. Um, was able to take the time, and you know, I know Kelly was. Uh, it was funny because Kelly had said, "Hey, I, I'm I got this job to do the in the summer," and I had just met with Bruce, and I was like. Uh, Kurt, you know, great. Kelly's going to take. <laughs> right. Kelly's going to take this job, you know, and <laughs> and um, you know, and how oblivious I was to the whole thing was funny. But two weeks later, we had to drive up to. There was a contest at Pismo Beach, and uh, my car was uh, Shane Dorian, Ross Williams, and Todd Chester. And we and Bruce called. He goes, "Hey, would you mind stopping by? We want to do a little test." I said, "Great." So obviously, those other three names were on the list. Mm-hmm. And I'm so stupid that I brought my competition. <laughs> you know, and all those guys are good, if not better than I do. And I'm like, and I left that place kind of like scratching my head. I'm like, am I the dumbest person? <laughs> I just, I just gave away my my dream job. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, I think they just wanted someone who a had the time, wasn't going to be distracted by competing stuff, and you know. Um, at that time, it was right when the ASP broke from having trials mm-hmm. um, and having it top 44. And I had done the back half of the tour that year. That was the first year Kelly qualified. I think Kelly uh, finished in the last spot, like 44th. I think it was 1992. Right. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and so that was, you know, it was a whole new world. And I either jump on the tour with everyone else or have this amazing opportunity. And, um I'm really lucky I got it because I wasn't ready to go on tour. I was, still felt I was probably a few years too young. And, um, you know, I do use that when I talk to kids about what they want to do. And, you know, you look right now, and the world tour is definitely very young. But um, typically I think the age of qualifying is 22 to 23. And, um, you know, I, when kids are kind of questioning, it's like you have such a long time to do this thing. Um, it's funny, I go back to those experiences and realize that you don't need to rush. Exactly. And uh, yeah, and, and if anyone can ex- advise them, it'd be you. Uh, O-Dogs had a question real quick, though. Uh, going back, uh, Hollister Ranch, is that where like, like is that, is that where Bruce Brown lives? Is that why you guys met there, the, the mythical <laughs> Hollister Ranch? Like, how'd you yeah, guys end yeah. up there? He, he, lives, he, he lives on the way up there. He doesn't live on the ranch, but he has access to the ranch. Oh. Um, so, and, you know, I've been up there a handful of times. I've never had great ways, but it was just... It makes you realize that's what California was and, you know, would still be like um, outside of the population explosion. You're right. Um, wow. Yeah. But, but I've that's never had great. great waves there, and I hear amazing things. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It's... <laughs> yeah. yeah but, but, you know, my question is, okay, what was it like working with uh, Wingnut? Um, I mean, of course, he's, he's, a, he's actually a neighbor of mine now, um, yeah. and the guy is so hilarious. I mean, the guy is probably the most animated, you know, 
personality I've ever met in my life. Yep. Well, and, and that's exactly it. Is that's, I think he, he made it easy for me um, because he is so outgoing. Um, I, I, you know, I typically am okay in one-on-one settings. As it gets larger, I typically shy away. Right. And, um, right. It was it was a really good partnership because he could kind of tell, like, okay, he's overwhelmed. He's you know whatever. And um, there was a funny joke. Uh, halfway through South Africa, I used to, you know, travel with these huge headphones and a uh, like a disc player. And uh, Dana Brown, Bruce's son, says to me one day, he's like. I've got to listen to him. What are you listening to? And this is, you know, halfway through the Africa trip. And uh, my batteries had run out. So I didn't have anything on, but I had my headphones on. <laughs> and I was like, I was so afraid to let him in on my secret. And uh, because we do drives, I mean, we do six to eight hours of driving a day um, to go do things. Um, and wow. uh, he realized, me, and, and he kind of smiled and he goes, okay, it's our secret. I won't tell anyone. I was like, oh. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, it, just, it was, um, you know, to be on and, and be energetic every day. You give a lot, you know, um, like any, any other man, <laughs> we like to hibernate. And uh, there isn't a lot of hibernation time on those trips. It's, you know, one time we were in Paris, it was crazy. It's, there's a scene, I don't know if it ever made a movie, but I'm driving this Ducheveau car through the city streets in Paris. And they say, hey, we want to get a shot of you guys on the freeway. Now, mind you, there's finding directions and all these things. There's no iPhones with maps and whatever. Right. So yeah, here I, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy. So we're driving through, and we're on a freeway, and I'm, I've got a walkie-talkie, and I know they're on a bridge ahead of me. And they go, okay, now we want you to stop in the middle of the freeway, pull out a map, and pretend that you're lost. Now, this isn't a Hollywood film that <laughs> everybody knows they're in the movies. Like, this is literally French traffic. People are trying to get to and from work. And, and I'm like, are you flipping kidding me? And so sure enough, we pull out the car, and we know it's got his longboard in the car. We've got the map out on the front of the car in rush hour traffic. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I bet people are yelling at you so loud. <laughs> oh, I was so happy I didn't speak French. I, 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 I have an idea of what they're saying. <laughs> Right, totally. Oh, my uh, God. So classic. Well, I thought the chemistry was great between you It guys. was. And, you know, and it's funny. I, I remember it so vividly when you decided to do the movie because you were just coming out of uh, the NSSA um, and, you know, jumping into that tour. And I, well, I remember everyone talking about it and, you know, when we were kids and we we're like, oh, my gosh, Pat O'Connell's going to make this Hollywood movie. Um, yeah. And then when we heard it was Wingnut and the, the whole chemistry, everything, it was such an awesome movie. It's great. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And, and we're talking about Endless Summer 2 and the star of that movie, Pat O'Connell, is here on Wax. And yeah, and, and in a lot of ways, Bruce Brown's genius in both those movies was was picking the two perfect surfers. I mean, you're like you're a guy that everyone rooted for. You're a guy that made us laugh. And the fact that it was a documentary is what kind of really was most fascinating about all of it. Uh, how like like was filming the movie similar to what you might see in reality TV today, where some of the scenes might have been staged? Or was everything really just impromptu and just completely on the fly? Um, you know, if I were to compare doing drive through and that, right. um, that was, uh, Endless Summer was way more staged, and it had to be because uh, we're using film. And so every time you hit the button, let's say it's 100 bucks just to turn, turn <laughs> right. that camera on. So, you know, which, which, I mean, it could have been more, but that was back then, you know. Um, so shooting film is expensive. In this day and age now with digital, um, you know, red cameras and all that stuff. I mean, it can be way more impromptu. Um, there are things that you obviously do want to, from a cinematic point of view that you want to set up, but you, you're able to um, let life happen a little bit more and not worry about the cost of burning film. Um, so we definitely had a plan. Right. When we go places, that's not to say we were so scripted that we couldn't do things, um, but we really did have to map it out a little bit because we just knew that okay, every time you hit that button, it's an expensive, uh, uh, it's an expensive reel. And um, so, so it's, you know, I drive through, I mean, the cameras were going basically all day. Right. And it was, it was only, it was only uh, an issue to the guy that had to sit through, you know, 900 hours of, you know, Donovan farting or something. <laughs> the rest of it was, um, actually, no, that was our issue. I'm sorry. That wasn't their issue. That was ours. I thought. All right. <laughs> But it was just so much, it's, it's a lot more free-flowing. 
uh, just for the and and you, and the, you know cameras too the these film cameras I mean uh, Don Nico, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> Uh, Don King and Jack McCoy and uh, and Dan Merkel were the the camera guys. Wow! Uh, wow, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and um, these these water housings we had were just I mean they were huge because they were carrying thirty five millimeter cameras, and so uh, any shot that they did get was pretty painstakingly hard in the surf. Um, you I know, can imagine. And, and, uh, Again, with these cameras that we have now today, I mean, you can hold them in the palm of your hand. I mean, look at the GoPro. It's incredible, right? Um, right. Just, it just allows, it's, it's so much easier. That's crazy. We're joined by Pat O'Connell here on Wax. And, you know, you're speaking of drive through which is a, uh, and again, like, it's crazy. Like, you've done, you did the Hollywood thing, Endless Summer 2, which was, you know, in most people's opinion, especially surfers, the greatest, like, surf film ever, or at least paired with number one, you know? And then... Yeah. And then you did the drive-through series, which was uh, like Browning did the filming and I think directing, and, and it was and the core of the movie was you, Donovan Frankenrider, Benji Weatherly, and then you had like a huge crew that came on for some, if not all, the uh, you know other episodes. We just had a uh, Kalani Rob on the on the show last week. Now and, and drive-through in for me was like one of the very few reasons I would watch Fuel. Every time yeah. it was on, it'd be on like at midnight sometimes. Sometimes it was on a prime time. And I'd just be glued, and I started DVRing these things, and I've seen pretty much every every episode. I had to watch the California series, the first season, like online, I think. But yep, do you, yep. do you miss it? Like it was such an entertaining. In my opinion, it was like what a surf show film should be. Like, do you miss doing that? Because it looked like you guys had a lot of fun. I totally miss it. I miss it now, especially because um, you know you have to create reasons. I mean, uh, work is busy, and and mm-hmm. we have a lot of responsibility, and we're we're having a lot of fun with it. But we're also you know, you have to create reasons to break away and have a and see different things. Otherwise, it can be very easy to get stuck in uh, a little pattern <laughs> right. and just be at work all the time. So, yeah, I do miss it. I will say, going into the last couple, um, I felt that it was probably time that I stepped aside, um, <laughs> <laughs> only because, you know, I'm very aware of, like, uh, new kids coming up and new opp- opportunities for those kids. So I, I kind of always felt like, okay, here's this guy who's got a job, he's got other things to do. You know, and it's a great opportunity for someone to be known. So I kind of always felt like, okay, you know, unless we did a real big reunion thing, it was probably my last time anyways. And I, I, th- I thought it would have been good for the show to find like an Alex Gray that would have taken my play or someone like that that would have, um, I guess, like been a little bit uh, just more, I guess, young. Right. You know, and um, because the thing is, you can hang on to these things and do them forever. And uh, I, not, not that that's a bad thing. No, and there's no, and I don't, under, and I guess I don't understand this need to go younger. I mean, it's not like you're old for starters, and you guys had a good thing going. I mean, I, I, personally, yeah. as a viewer, I didn't get tired of you guys. So, you yeah, know, if, cool, if you thanks. if you did more, I think a lot of people would actually welcome it and, and be excited. But um, I also get yeah. what you're, I get where you're saying from too, where you yeah. come from too. No, it's funny. Is um, it's we've we've I've gone in and, and met with uh, the Fuel TV guys quite a few times. A guy, a good friend, uh, Michael Bloom, has taken that over. I knew my I met Michael when he worked at MTV. Uh, when we did the, uh, in the summer, and he was actually, we did a thing with MTV um, back then, and he was working, he was, came, he was the one who came up with Beach MTV, <laughs> if you want to, you know, date it, like, he's really that, uh, and a really good guy, and he's there, and he um, has been working, you know, hey, we can try to do this, this, and this, and I just think the network is finally making some money with the MMA stuff, so, um, where I, I think that they, they, built something that was cool but probably financially wasn't making a whole lot of sense well in my in my humble opinion i, I think drive through is one of the things that was carrying that that network at least on the surfing side of things because yeah. i don't think it's a coincidence that right when your show ended they they, 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 they ditched it they went to mma <laughs> yeah that was a weird transition totally we're joined by pat o'connell uh here on wax oh no i got a question yeah, I do. So, um, you know, okay, we're talking about traveling, of course, Pat, and one of the best things about being a surfer and a professional surfer. Are you still traveling a lot? Did you get over to Bells and over to um, the first part of the leg? Are you going to go to the second part and all that good stuff? You know, um, yeah, I, I still get to travel quite a bit, as you can imagine, Omar. It's like nice. I've got, I, I just, I sit there and look at all the, like, basically my responsibility has changed. So it's, you know, kind of looking after a bunch of things. And so um, when I was there, I, I did go to the Gold Coast. I was there for um, probably almost three weeks. Wow. Um, and then, wow. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was really it was unbelievable. Minus the fact that it rained almost every day. Um, uh, no, but, uh, but we did get some waves, and then um, you know I came home just a touch early before the real good waves came because you know John had hurt himself in the express concession, so um, you know I brought him back and uh, you know helped him with get on the road to recovery. So, um, but but as I look at the year, there's going to be um, our brand. We're going to approach kind of these events and, and moments kind of like the like grand slams. And so we're picking moments that we're going to, you know, especially with our athlete roster now that we want to show up and, you know, have a, you know, those Olympic moments. Right. And so uh, I'll definitely be on hand for those, but probably staying back most of the time. Um, I'm actually going to Uruguay on Thursday and then to Buenos Aires for a couple of days. There's wow. A, our distributor down there is doing an event, and so uh, I'm going to go hang out and ride a couple ways with those guys. So um, it'll be nice to take a break. Yeah. <laughs> from oh, I bet, I bet. And, and uh, when you're on the road, are you, you getting in the water a bunch? Yeah, I'm going to surf a lot there. I, I, I kind of need it. I, I went to the doctor yesterday. I was, I've had this cough for like a, a month, and I jumped on the on the scale, and uh, <laughs> I realized that um, I need to go surfing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, dude. And I, I, got, I got one more question for you. Of course, uh, you know, with uh, running the Hurley team right now um, and me being from Santa Cruz, I got asked the question, um, what did you think of uh, Nat Young's performance? It was so insane. And, um, you know, he's, he's, such, a, he's such a favorite. Um, yeah. You know, maybe not totally in the big media's eyes because they obviously have their darlings in Kelly Parker or whoever, you know, John John Dane. Um, but anybody who knows Matt or is a fan of surfing um, just absolutely thinks he's like the greatest thing in the world. And uh, I can't say I was surprised that he did so well. Um, he was actually on my fantasy surfer team. So, uh, nice. So I, I did choose him. Um, so I can't say I'm too surprised. But anybody that goes to an event and competing at that high of a level um, and he's never been to that place, to yeah. do so well is uh, is is a testament to uh, how great he is, and I, I thought it was cool. I read the surfing piece uh, last night that Nick Carroll had called out that hey, this is the place that he's going to do really well. Mm. Um, he said that right after the Snapper Rocks on his little tool review, and uh, you know, it's I, I wouldn't say it's an obvious thing that Nat's going to get big results uh, to most people because they're going to look at only the a few names, but when you kind of dig into it and you actually watch how solid he competes and how smart he is and tenacious, um, yeah. he's going to have an amazing career. Absolutely. And we got to get Nat on the show here soon. And we're joined by Pat O'Connell uh, here on Waxed. Uh, and going, and by the way, Nat Young will be a media darling, in my opinion. He's so new on the scene that, I mean, he's, he's going to get there soon. I mean, he fits the yep. profile. But, um, Going back real quick in your career, you once you finished filming all the you know the endless summer two, and then you got your your competitive career back on track. You got on the ASP World Tour. You competed for I think close to ten years, and then you when you retired, I believe this was like in two thousand one, somewhere around there. I might not have the date exactly correct, but it was it was almost like this amazingly seamless transition from retiring from the from the World Tour. You still were like this huge name. I mean, you are now, but I mean, you still I mean like you requalified. You could have kept doing this. Then you went right into this head of marketing position with Hurley. Um, yeah. And you're doing this today. Like, so obviously you love the job. What does the job entail? Like, what do you do? Like, like what is the, the day-to-day operation as a head of marketing for this huge brand like Hurley? You know what? We, my, my job is pretty simple. I work with Bob Hurley, uh, Evan Slater, um, mm. and, so, so, you know, and some other great people around whatever. But, you know, it's, we're, we're a pretty focused and simple bunch. You know, we love surfing. We're a fan of the sport. Um, and, and it really gets to a place where, um, you know, if, if I go back, I'll give you a couple of examples. So when we um, – I, I left doing the tour, and I was tired. I was I, – if you can believe this, I kept going to these places. And, go, and, you know, if walking down the path at Bells, the little thing, doesn't yeah. get your heart bumping, you realize you're probably not doing the right thing. But I kind of got to that place. Wow. So, Literally going into the year, I had told uh, Bob and, and uh, Jeff Hurley at the time, said, hey, guys, this, this might be it for me. Um, is there something else I can do? I feel like I have other things that I want to do. I just I don't want to be lost at tour, and I don't want to keep doing this thing when um, I'm, I don't know if I'm really that into it. So 
that's how that started. And so basically, my, my plan was building a strategy to make, at least within the, the surf circle, is probably this really great, very surf-oriented feeling brand. Um, at the same time, we were aligning with a, a new board short proposition and making the greatest board shorts and really owning that part of the market, and that's the phantom board short. Um, so, and we were also kind of looking at basically setting up home base. And Bob, Bob's from Huntington Beach, so, okay, what a better place than Surf City, you know, with all the, the retail and everything. It's like, okay, well, that all sort of lines up and makes sense. And so it was basically uh, my job and our job to kind of create opportunities for us to tell our brand story. And so that came out in Hurley Pro, which um, was the boost. We acquired that from, from Boost. Um, so we had a performance event in California, and then you kind of went up the road uh, a month or so earlier with the U.S. Open, which, you know, also came to us through the IMG relationship. And so then it was like, okay, how do we make this bigger and better? How do we bring, you know, if, if you remember the economy was so so down, yeah. um, how do we bring the best surfers back to Huntington Beach and try to give a shot, you know, in the arm for uh, the industry? And so it was our task to kind of create something. So we created an all-star event. Um, and it was just a, it was just basically an excuse to get Kelly and and Dan and Parco and uh, Taj and you know John John and whoever it may be Nick Fanning all to the U.S. Open again and compete in front of all the masses. And um, that was a goal, and it was absolutely uh, it totally worked. I mean, it was great. It it felt like you know you knew that when you went to Huntington Beach, it was uh, that was going to happen. And so. You know, now it's we we have a great athlete roster, and we're trying mm-hmm. to learn how to tell their stories better and be a better brand to so that they feel like they're getting you know some publicity. They're helping with product, um, and then us just being the leaders in the sport and you know not stopping, just driving the sport through. I work, you know, I, I do a lot of work with ASP, and um, you know, I'm hoping to you know as this new tour is coming on board. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been on the board for the last five years. So, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to help kind of push and direct. And whenever they have a question, I mean, they're much smarter guys than I am. Well, they're but, smart in that they're listening to you, in my opinion. That's, that's, that's a yeah, really good, I didn't realize you're on the board for the last five years. And, and I, and I really hope, um, and personally, I'm really nitpicking when it comes to the webcast commentators. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I really hope you're in that booth more often because when there's only, you know what I'm saying? Like you're really good at it, dude. Like when you're in there, everyone is like happy. You know, there's there's little to no criticism. You know what I'm saying? Where like anyone else outside of like yourself, Shane Dorian, there's only like a handful of guys that when they're in that broad that broadcast booth, people are just stoked. They're like, all right, now we got the webcast crew. Let's watch the surfing. Otherwise, yeah, it's so, cool. yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? But um, anyways, Pat, you, we've taken a, so much of your time this morning. I know you got to go surf and do a million other things. You're running one of the biggest brands in the world. Dude, thank you so much, man. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Is there anything you want to promote before we let you go? No, I mean, I just, uh, I'm just i stoked to be here, guys. Thank you very much. I, I It's it's an honor to uh, to be able to do this. Oh, man, and, thank you. Um, I like talk radio, and so uh, <laughs> it's fun to talk. And uh, Omar, I miss you, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Sounds like yeah. you are. You too, man. No, it's great. I'm with you, and I'll, I'll you know, for sure see you around, man. Thank you so much. And, and have a wonderful. Yep. And oh uh, yeah, no, yeah. And we're we're not that far from you. If you ever want to just come in here and host, dude, doors open anytime you want to come in, dude. It's all you. If you love talk radio, this the, the chair is always available for you, brother. And thank you so much again, dude. Thank you. Anytime, boys. Have a wonderful Saturday. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Pat. Take care. That was Pat O'Connell here on Wax, and then we'll have some news next. And follow us on Twitter at Wax Radio. And our website's waxedradio.com, where if you missed any portion of that interview, you can go to our website uh, a little later today, and the interview will be up. Uh, let's do some news next with Natalie Rose. This is Wax on ESPN 1700. Visit our website, waxedradio.com, to get complete show podcasts. And follow us on all social media at Waxed Radio. Now, here's a recap of the week in surf news. And there's a lot going on this week in surf news. First off, O-Dog, that was one of the best interviews we've ever done. That was great. And you know what? And, of course, it's Pat O'Connell. I mean, what a pro. Um, such a great guy. I'm an asset to the sport of surfing. Yes. Uh, he's such a good guy. I can't say enough good things. You're 100% agreed. I, and honestly, dude, like, 
wouldn't he be the perfect guy outside of maybe Kelly? And even, I don't know if Kelly would be the best guy. Wouldn't he be the perfect guy to just run the ASP? Oh, definitely. You know, and Pat's always uh, listened. I think yeah. that's such a, a good part of Pat and pays attention um, to where, like you said, a lot of the guys um, doing the commentating or other aspects of, of the sport right now, I feel are a little closed-minded. Yeah, and he's not dev- – exactly. dude, he just – he embodies surfing, dude. He is the guy. And it was thank yeah. you so much again to Pat O'Connell. If you missed that interview, just go to our website, waxedradio.com. That's waxedradio.com. And follow us on Twitter, at waxedradio, to follow – or just to find out who we're going to have on the show each week, get links to the interviews themselves and all the, all sorts of great surfing news. Speaking of which, Natalie Rose hosts our weekly news segment. There's a lot happening this week. Natalie, take it away. Yeah, there is a lot happening this week. Um, earlier this week, bells were ringing, which meant Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach was wrapped up. Winning the contest and ringing the bell for the men's was Brazilian Adriana de Souza. As for the females, Carissa Moore took home the victory. But the bells were not the only thing making noise at the contest. It was reported from an ASP insider that random administrated drug tests were given at the end of round three of the contest. The insider claimed that four top surfers were tested on, and four of them did, excuse me, three of them did take the test, but one of them did deny. The name of the surfer who refused the test has not yet been released. This is not the first time drug tests were given on the tour this year. At the Quicksilver Pro and Roxy, officials went in an all-out blitz, randomly testing competitors throughout the contest. And and there's a lot more to the story, and there's a few angles to this. For starters, you're right. The, the drug testing was introduced last year. Then Kelly Slater did an interview a couple months ago that made it controversial in that he said he was only tested once at the beginning of the year and never happened again, which raised the question, what's the point of doing drug testing if you're not going to actually do the testing? So then this year, they, they, they do testing on both men's and, men and women. Uh, the Quicksilver Pro, um, and then there's this incident where reportedly uh, one of the top five surfers in the world, and maybe top four, whatever you said, was tested, refused. I believe in our pre-show meeting we went over the story. I believe that surfer pushed an AF- ASP official, if, if I'm not mistaken. He shoved the man because he did not want to get tested. Yeah, and then he got in like a verbal abuse. So like they were going around like testing people afterwards, like whoever won their heat in the third round. And then they pulled him aside, one of the surfers who's obviously not named. And, uh, yeah, he got in a full-on of, like physical and verbal argument. Officials had to hold him back, and it was... Yeah, he essentially flipped out. He said he didn't want to take the test, which obviously raises questions there. And then they, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they told him he has 24 hours to take the test or else he's off the ASP World Tour. Correct. I'm guessing he did take the test since we haven't heard anybody being booted off the World Tour. Odog, have you heard about this story? No, I've heard a little bit about it. Um, you know, my curiosity with the, the whole drug controversy in the sport of surfing, I mean, uh, I mean, are the guys taking enhancing drugs? I mean, I, I'd imagine they're taking the opposite. <laughs> well, here's the, well, here's the thing. Like three years ago, and it may have been even longer than that, somebody was tested positive for per- performance enhancing drugs. The Brazilian guy. I can't remember his name. Oh, uh, Neko Potter. Thank you. And he actually yeah. tested positive, and he was booted. And he was banned for, I believe, a year, and, he's, and he came back eventually. So there are examples sure. of this happening. Now, you're right. In this instance, the vast majority of the drugs that these athletes are probably taking, excuse me, probably have nothing to do with performance-enhancing drugs. It has everything to do with booze and weed and stuff like that. And they actually have stipulations where if you get caught for weed, for example, the first right. time you just get a warning. It's like a slap on the wrist. Nothing serious is going to happen. Your name's not going to get put out there. But in this case, I mean, if that was the only thing the surfer had to be worried about, like, why the reaction? You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Well, you know, in, in the case of Neko Paderat, too, I believe it was cortisone, if I'm not mistaken, which, I mean, is a lot of athletes use it. You know, a football players shoot up on the sidelines yeah. with cortisone. So, you know, and a lot of people take it for asthma and pneumonia and all these sort of things, whether it's, you know, a, it is a steroid, but not a full-on steroid that he took every day to get more buffed. I'm not really sure. Um, but, yeah, you know, my whole take is it's going to be weed over a, a sport-enhancing drug nine yeah. out of ten times with servers. <laughs> <laughs> weed and surfing is like peanut butter and jelly, baby. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> And I don't speak for myself, just for the record. But, um... And now, now here's now there is yet another angle to the story. All right, and the story again is supposedly a top five ASP World Tour surfer was asked to take a drug test at the uh, at the Rip Curl Pro Bells. He 
He refused. He got into a huge altercation with some ASP officials, and they told him, take the test within 24 hours or you're off the tour. Here's the other part of the story, which is amazing, is that the reporter of the story was one of the writers for Transworld Surf. They took the story down immediately. Like, it was up, and then it was gone, right? So, so people did see it, but you couldn't link to it. Now, one of the, a listener of our show, Mike, who actually runs a great surf, for, uh, surf forecast site, it's PacificWaveRider.com, he actually got the cache, like the history of that site, and saved it, published it on his site, and that's how this thing got out. Which raised the question, why is Transworld such a gutless wuss when it comes to anything controversial? Like, I guarantee whoever sponsors this surfer went to Transworld and said, take the story down, we advertise with you, our money's out if you don't do this. And they said, okay, whatever you want, because we, you know, we have zero journalistic integrity. That, it's fascinating, and it's really just, I don't know, it's such, colossally disappointing to me that such a big surf publication would have zero integrity when it comes to Lisa Journalism here. What's your take, O-Dog? You know, it's actually really surprising me lately, uh, the trans world controversy. Obviously, you know, first up this year with the Quicksilver um, post that they put uh, about Quicksilver firing yes. all the people. And then, you know, they explain what that is. Explain, explain and then, what, and then O-Dog. Stab, Stab went in uh, and posted it as well. So, so yeah, it's, it's weird. Omar, explain real quick the, the, the trans world business story real quick regarding Quicksilver, like, like for people that don't know what happened there. Of course. So, I mean, uh, so this year, Trans World, which is interesting because Trans World has been all, it's been known for being the controversial um, magazine. It's always had the funniest interviews. It's gone on the borderline of swearing, but not swearing. I love the writers over there. They do a great job. Cote and the boys are awesome. Um, but of course, this year, um, Quicksilver announced um, within the industry that they were going to be firing a lot of people. And Trans World was the very first to report this. They posted it and then took it down the next day. Um, and that was that Quicksilver was going to be firing most of their athletes, pulling back in the market because uh, their stocks were down, stuff like that. And then uh, Stab got a hold of the article and reposted it immediately and then also talked about this controversy of pulling it down. Um, and it sounds like Transworld uh, kind of got in the same situation. Um, we should get those guys on. Uh, they yeah. live in San Diego. You know, let, let's, uh, I'll, I'll shoot those guys from Texas. It'd be great to get their take because, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, to me it's weird. Growing up in the surf industry, Transworld was the hardcore magazine, and now that they're pulling these uh, stories that are great, you know, the fact that they're actually putting them up and they're these controversial stories and pulling them down so quick, really interesting. Yeah, and but see, you're see, and when you when you talk about Transworld, you're, it, there's almost two different types of controversial, right? There's a controversial where you're kind of being edgy with swear words with maybe stuff that, like, the more conservative person might get slightly offended by. Then there's the, the other type of controversial where you're talking about honest reporting that may offend your advertisers. And in that regards, I don't know if Transworld's ever really gone that direction where they'd, they'd be willing to report something that's true at the expense of possibly making one of their sponsors look bad. I don't know if they've ever gone that route before. And and to be honest, yeah, I'd love to get one of the one of the writers on. I don't share the same opinion with you, for the record. I think they're they're writers, at least nowadays, are amateur hour at best. But you know, you and I, you and I can differ, and that's fine. But but yeah, agree but disagree. but yeah, exactly, agree to disagree. But if we get them on, I mean, I don't know what they would tell us other than, well, you know, our our magazine survives on our advertisers. We can't piss them off, and you win. We don't have journalistic integrity. I, I mean, I don't know what else they tell us. I would love to get them on. And talk about it. And if you can make that happen, please do, brother. That'd be awesome. But um, yeah, it's crazy story, and and you know, it's fun to talk about. And uh, I'm definitely curious to know more. You know, at least to get more of the details. It's just a shame that in this industry, there's very little journalism and very little resources put into you know getting this kind of knowledge um, behind the scenes. Yeah. But uh, anyways, yeah. <laughs> well, well, hopefully we'll get those guys on. And, and uh, hey, on, on my defense, they they did post it. Yes. They tried. <laughs> you, know, so, uh, you know what I mean? But, uh, but yeah, definitely agreed. Um, they probably got a heavy phone call from a heavy hitter and they got pulled down. So, so true. <laughs> nice, nice save. <laughs> agree, to, agree to disagree. I totally agree with you there, dude. That, that yeah. is true. I'll give them that. Props for at least trying. <laughs> yeah. Good point, right? uh, all right. What, what else is going on in the news, Natalie? 
Um, well, the Beach League Classic is finished. The, the, what, the what classic? The Beach League, excuse okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mouthful. Seven-time world champ Lainey Beachley announced that her contest will not be held in 2013. The contest started out in 2006 and was the richest event on the Women's ASP World Tour, giving away a purse prize up to $140,000. Now, look, I'm not going to lie. I don't study the ASP Women's World Tour like I would really anything else. You study other parts of it. I though. study. I study the <laughs> photo. Yeah, I study the photos when they're in warm water events. <laughs> and so, with all that said, I do know that the the Beachley. So Lane Beach. I think it's Lane Beachley. It's not Laney Beachley, but uh, but it's okay. That's right. That's right. I believe she right when she retired. She's a former seven-time world champion, one of the greatest female surfers ever. She started this contest in Australia. Very prestigious. Like you mentioned, I believe, you know, they, they had the biggest prize purse last year. But women's surfing is definitely among the top of the list in terms of cutbacks. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't know for sure if this is true, but I think that the, the ASP Women's World Tour, after this current event that they're having in New Zealand, is done for the year. Is that true, O'Dog? Do you know or do you follow this as much as I do? You know, I don't follow their tour that much, um, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> that was their last event. But, um, yeah, I'd say in the sport of surfing, they have suffered immensely yes. over the last couple of years on cutbacks. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because that segment of our industry is going through huge changes. I mean, it had such a huge, huge influx of cash during the boom of Roxy and all those companies and everyone getting into uh, women's surf apparel. Um, and now it's just having major issues. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the women now, they rip. They, they surf very, very good, mm -hmm. um, and as Cyrus said, um, they have become pleasing <laughs> to spectate as well in other ways. Um, so the tour has changed for a good way, you know, in, in that aspect. It has changed for good reasons, but, but I mean, yeah, as far as uh, funding and everything, it just it looks, it looks tough for them. It, do, it does, but uh, best of luck to the ladies. I mean, they do rip, and most of them are incredibly hot. Um, <laughs> Not that that should matter, but it does. And uh, what else? Uh, let's maybe try to squeeze in one more story. What's going on, Natalie? Here's a small one, but I think this one's kind of been happening for a while, but now it's starting to get kind of crucial and starting to become a bigger deal. Um, base manufacturers fear that surfer surfboards will no longer be made here in the U.S. Um, the cost of labor, supplies, and duty tax is way cheaper in foreign countries, which could cause surfboards no longer to be made here. In the U.S., you know that's a an O'Dog. You would have more knowledge about this than me, but this is something that is definitely trending towards more and more reality, or it's trending more towards reality. Whatever. Uh, every day, you probably are, are hearing from surfboard manufacturers locally who are getting pissed and bent that people are manufacturing by the buttload out in China, Mexico, and even Mexico. O'Dog, yep. what's your take on all this? I mean, is is the future bleak for local surfboard shapers? I, you know, it, it has become extremely tough for them. But there is actually a segment of the surf industry that I w have read about that is up, and that's custom surfboards. Mm. So is it going to go 100% overseas? No, it never will. Um, but, yeah, it's become more tough. I mean, we've seen Clark Foam just because of uh, clean air standards. Um, you know, they had major issues, obviously. Um, you know, and it, it, it is cheaper to do it overseas. And an uh, interesting thing is a uh, surfboard's, They've gotten more expensive, but not compared to, you know, typical inflation. You know, uh, right. I think a wetsuit is a great example. You know, a wetsuit uh, back in the day cost, uh, what, like, you know, $199 to $299. You know, those are up to $600. Surfboards haven't changed in price that much. That's um, true. But the materials have, have uh, gone way up. So these guys are hurting. You know, their, their profit margin on a job, on, on like one board, is really low. So, you know, it is sad, but the good news is custom boards are up. So, you know, if you if you want to get a board that's custom for you and you totally should if you surf, um, hit up your local shaper and, and go for it. Um, you know, meanwhile, the mass productions will probably, you know, be overseas. And a lot of most of it's actually in Thailand, which yeah, is crazy. Which is, so. that is crazy. And, and you can thank Walmart. You can thank uh, Target. You can thank Costco for that reason because they're mass producing these wave storms and all this other yeah. stuff. Um, which is yeah, you're right. But the the custom board uh, industry is still thriving. You're right. Like I, I was, you know, some months back, I was talking to Jed Knoll, who owns Knoll Surfboards up in San Clemente, and and his business is doing great because people come to him on the reg. 
uh, wanting their own personal, personal customized board. So in that regards, yes, the local shapers are thriving. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's you have a lot more options out there, and they're cheap. O-Dog, great show as always. Thank you, sir. Of course. Brother, and, <laughs> great job, and thank you, Natalie. And yes, Natalie Rose. Hey, now. Thank you, Omar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you missed any portion of the show, go to our website, waxedradio.com. That's waxedradio.com. Omar's brother finally built the site. We're going to... Definitely spruce it up some more. There's one section on there I think all the gents will love. It's called Waxed with three X's. And uh, we're going to be throwing a lot of beautiful surfing ladies on that section of the page. And uh, if you miss any portion of any show, just go to our website. And uh, entire shows are available there. Special thanks to Pat O'Connell, head of marketing uh, for Hurley. It's the start of Endless Summer 2. Uh, just really one of the best interviews we've ever done. It was a pleasure to have him on the show. And uh, we'll be back next week. And follow us on Twitter as well, Wax Radio. Thank you, Natalie Rose, for being so hot and being so talented. O-Dog, thank you. And we'll talk to you next week, man. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Coming up next, the greatest golf show in Southern California, Farmers Inside the Ropes. I'm Cyrus Sotsas. This is Wax on ESPN 1700. That is it for us today, and we will leave you with a... I, I can't do it. No. We'll do it live! <laughs> it. Do it live! <laughs> thing sucks!